So welcome everyone and uh, thank you so much for making the time and the effort to be here. Uh, this is my first time and HashiCorp's first time to support and sponsor DevOps Singapore, so hopefully you'll see us more often. Uh, before I start, I'd like to see a raise of hands. How many of you work with our tools? Uh, uh, nice. All right. That, that's going to be a super friendly conversation then. Uh, let's, uh, let's get to it. Now, before we start, I don't, I, I don't have a lot of time, uh, so I'm going to go as quick as possible and to, in order to leave some for the Q&As after we finish. Uh, but let's, let's, let's have a look. So, so first of all, for the people who never met me before, uh, I've been with Hajiku for almost like a year and a half now. I'm based in Melbourne in Australia. Uh, from the picture you can see I was, uh, uh, and until now I, I do scuba diving a lot. Uh, when there's a boat, I can always be your dive master on the boat and take you to the best sites um, around the oceans. Uh, uh, I love playing with new tech, whether that's uh, a new tool that we have, a new tool that somebody else has, see where that fits in, in the organization. And I've been doing tech jobs for almost uh, 10 years now. Uh, I, was, uh, I was with analytics before DevOps, and that was, uh, that was a great journey before that. We were back in the Solaris days, um, and that was a lot of fun back in the day. Uh, great, so for the people uh, who doesn't know HashiCorp, uh, you probably, even if you heard of HashiCorp, you probably heard of some products, like you're probably either using Vagrant, a bit of Packer, some of Vault, some of Console. There is a story behind all of those tools together because as part of any DevOps conversation, one of those tools comes up all the time. Um, but for, you have to see where we see the world from because we see the world in three different uh, complete uh, layers. And we, 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 made, we made it clear that those layers are separate, not because of the technology is different, the technology is the same, but the duties are totally different. The people who are working about securing the platform are different from the people who are running it, are different from the people who are actually provisioning it as well. So this is why we have that segregation of duty happening here based on the tool. So uh, for the people who doesn't know Vagrant, uh, kind of like a testing tool for dev developers to uh, mimic environment and it all started uh, from, I don't want to rebuild VM machines all the time, I just have Vagrant to rebuild everything for me. Uh, Packer to do a very similar things on, on the cloud side where I can pack an image and rather than doing those pre-installation requirement on the image every time, Packer can do everything for me. Uh, from the beginning and uh, Terraform obviously uh, our infrastructure as a cool tool uh, I can provision whatever I want on any cloud I want uh, with with a single uh, piece of code uh, But this is where the security uh, piece comes in because part of my provisioning I always have some secrets that are being shared. I have a password here I have a username here I might have a secret token that is stored somewhere and the last thing we want is to keep those in secret, in, uh, kind of like in a clear text in my uh, GitHub repository or something. Uh, this is where Vault comes in to secure my valuables in a space where uh, only authorized uh, workflows and people can actually access it and provide a lot of more securities, like encrypted storage for that. Uh, I can have uh, uh, something like a key management system within Vault. Uh, and it's totally agnostic. So you can have Vault running in different cloud provider, you can have Vault running on-prem, uh, and you don't have a tie to a certain kind of uh, technology to do that. From a runtime environment, this is, uh, this is a bit complex because a, a mainframe could be a runtime environment, a server could be a runtime environment, uh, a cloud platform could be a runtime environment, Kubernetes becomes a runtime environment. We have Nomad with specializing container scheduling, uh, and it's one of the fastest and easiest way to schedule containers on the fly. Uh, and finally, we got console, which is the talk of the day, that is supposed to link everything here together. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about how we're moving from the static world to dynamic world and where console plays a massive role in, uh, in this architecture. So the service mesh is specifically, it's a, like everybody's calling a lot of things service mesh now, but for us service mesh is mainly uh, showing a feature called console connect, which allows us to have a lot of different uh, ways for containers, for example, to talk together, for virtual machines to talk together. So my service mesh is not something that I can do in a single platform. We're trying to do a service mesh across all the data centers, which is the server learning, which is what everybody wanna do. I wanna be able to advertise my Kubernetes services in my Azure cloud environment. 
to my virtual machines uh, in my local data center. This is, this is how broad are we looking at about this problem. So if you look at the evolution of the infrastructure, uh, 10 years ago we were working with single physical server, a web server, a database server at the end of the story, which moved to a dynamic virtual machines where we start virtualizing those servers and having everything in VM farms, which also works perfectly fine. I had static IPs here, I had also static IPs. That was totally easy, firewall rule to allow a database to talk to the web server, and that was it. But in the, in the recent three to five years, uh, we started going with more ephemeral infrastructure. Cloud instances that tend to restart and die all the time because we're just provisioning more <laughs> stuff out of them. Uh, containers where I have multiple instances of the same web server or the database server, and actually some, somebody's trying to connect to. This is where the problem is because I can't, the unit of the IP address is no longer the right unit to work with. Uh, I have to keep track of hundreds of IP addresses in the container workflow in order just to know which service is allowed to talk to which other service. Uh, and this is, this is mainly what we call the shift from the static world into the dynamic world. I can't say I want to connect to this IP address anymore because that will be super hard to maintain and follow. But what makes sense now is to say I am, I'm a web server, I want to connect to a database server. Whatever that database server is, connect me to. Uh, so, if you even look at the bigger problem, uh, this is mainly when we're talking about applications, for example, that we're trying to create, and that application consists of multiple services. I try to encapsulate the application in a bubble, in a VPC, in a network segment, call it whatever you want to call it, and put a load balancer in front of it, and allow uh, people to only reach out to the load balancer, which is a problem by itself, because once this start multiplies by thousands, you have a thousand firewall and a thousand VPC to manage. Uh, compared to dynamic where everything is kind of like completely open and we're going to talk about how, how do we do that. So for us service mesh consists, consists of those major three uh, components and how we do them within console itself. So first of all the service discovery. Every new service that comes in the platform has to know what services are available for me out there, what services I can connect to and I'm allowed to connect to, and how do I connect to that service. Uh, the service segmentation. Am I in a zone that allows me to connect to this service? I might have a service on a cloud provider, on-prem, uh, and somewhat else, but I'm an application that needs to connect to a specific segment because I live within that segment. The last thing I want is to go and connect to another region. Uh, which is the same uh, service could be possibly living there. So this is, this is what service segmentation is about. And configuration, finally, every new service that comes up has to have some config, some information to boot up with uh, uh, and get injected into uh, the pod, the container, or the virtual machine itself. And this is also what console uh, covers. So by the time your instance comes up, console will actually wrap the whole services around it and give it the all information it needs to participate as part of that cluster. Uh, it's very important to understand our principle when we look at the world. When we create something, it has to be codified. It has to be totally automated. I don't want human users to be clicking next and back and that sort of stuff. It should be something codified to start with. And it's all about uh, the workflow itself. We don't tie to technology. We don't say we're Kubernetes only. We don't say uh, we're uh, Azure only, for example. We work across uh, super agnostic. We allow you to pick the right tools at the end of the day that works for you, for you to rest assured that our tools will always work on any platform. And thanks to our open source community that helped us uh, keep in an update on this. Uh, extension and integration uh, along with the open source communities uh, and with our own tools itself. First class integration with our tools is out of the box from HashiCorp. Uh, the second is the community providers that we work with, uh, like the Kubernetes team, for example, or Docker, uh, or uh, <coughs> Nginx, for example. So, <coughs> which takes me to the first topic, uh, which is service discovery. How do we do service discovery and, and uh, what, what is kind of like the challenges we see? If, if you look at how do I do dynamic infrastructure? Imagine, imagine part of every app, I'm actually deploying a load balancer on top of it. Multiply that by the number of apps. We have a lot of load balancers that we're talking about. How, and, and eventually we just have that virtual IP that we want to connect to in order to connect us back to that service. 
Uh, and this is something we, with the dynamic infrastructure with console, you'll automatically, uh, you don't need to connect to that virtual IP anymore. You just interrogate console, where's that service? And console will tell you the service is here and provide you with the IP, current IP address that you can, uh, can uh, connect you. So if you look at the pr previous generation application, uh, we could have a, a service A, service B, C, D, could be a web database and a cache, for example. And, uh, and in, in the microservices, we have a very similar thing, except that they're not tied together in a one box or one VM or one uh, segment uh, uh, at the end of the day, but they're just open. So I have the same services out there for consumption as long as you're allowed to uh, connect to them. But how does a microservice A connect to B? Uh, what if B has multiple instances of it? How do I know which one to connect to? Uh, I might have multiple web servers at the end of the day and A is trying to talk to a web server. In the past, I'll put a load balancer, those are web servers, and I'll put up some sort of a rule in the load balancer on how to connect to that web server. However, the way we see it working is whenever I have a new web server, it will go and register itself. And whenever I have a new cache, whenever I have a new database, it will go and register itself with console. So it will say, console, I came up, I'm here, I'm healthy, I'm available, and I'm ready for consumption. So next time service A wants to connect to a service B, it will go and ask console who's available for me, and console will provide you with the information or provide the service with the information that allows you to connect to it. This is the very basic principle of service discovery and how console work. Uh, once you pass this, this is when we start talking about uh, a little bit of advanced feature. Uh, so what we have just mentioned was just a bit of service res registry and DNS services. You got an HTTP interface in order to ask and interrogate console. Uh, you get the load balancing as part of console as well. Uh, and that, that mainly, how do I connect to those services? Uh, console can have a round robin method of just uh, connecting you to the next service available. Most important part is the health checks. I don't want you to get connected to a bad service. So when we have, uh, and we, we have a bit of covered a couple of slides on them, but it mainly talks about if this service is unhealthy, make sure nobody connects to it. Uh, and we can define what, a, what is a healthy and unhealthy. And the most important part is multi-data center. So I can have a DC1, DC2 in Sydney and Melbourne and Singapore and region one and region two in the cloud. And console can be aware of each other with what we call a WAN gossip between <coughs> all of those clusters. Uh, if, uh, if we dig a little bit deeper, what defines a service in console? This is a very uh, simple uh, registration of a service. I'm registering and I'm telling console, this is a service called Redis that operates on port 8000 and I can add whatever tags I want. Tags are cool. I can do a lot of reporting later on out of them. Uh, and I can also inject some stuff and tell console to connect to things based on tags. Uh, I can do checks. Uh, uh, for example, I want to check do a ping on the Redis network and the timeout is one second, that becomes of a check. If that is not uh, tested correctly, the service will be uh, deemed unhealthy. Uh, and, and I can also have a, a Redis script that keeps on uh, getting testing the uh, configuration itself and make sure that everything runs every 10 seconds. Uh, which takes me to, to the health check. So it's mainly if I want to do an extra health check on the memory utilization, for example, uh, I can every 10 seconds do a check memory script that runs on that service and uh, as long as I'm getting the uh, results I need, this service will always mark as healthy. Uh, web UI has been a long journey for us in the web UI. This is the second version of the web UI which actually visualizes all of your infrastructure for you in a services layer. Uh, and there's another tab on a nodes layer that shows you on a physical infrastructure, but uh, the services layer becomes very important. It shows you everything, the graphs, uh, the health monitoring scripts, and everything uh, you want to see um, in there. Uh, <coughs> The service segmentation is uh, mainly how do I define, uh, uh, I might be a payment platform that lives within a payment uh, 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 part of the, uh, the infrastructure, for example, and shouldn't go and use other services from outside the payment platform. So I can define a segment of what I call a payment infrastructure and make sure all the services there, mainly consuming those services that lives in that payment um, infrastructure. So service segmentation becomes 
um, important. And this is something like um, I have those services. In the past, like one, one of the major challenges is how do I define access to those services? How do I say this service is allowed to talk to the service in, in, the, in, in the new world? In the past world, it was easy. I had a database server and a web server. And all what you needed to do was create a firewall rule that says web can talk to DB. But how does it work with uh, with, with the new infrastructure, it becomes super complex because can you imagine how many firewall rules you'll be working on? And can you imagine every time a container dies and spins up with a new IP address, somebody has to go and update a firewall rule over there just to make this happen. And this, is, this, is, this becomes pretty frustrating and annoying, uh, especially on an overhead and maintenance uh, sort of a space. In Console Connect, this is, th this is w what we think is the world they're moving to. If I have a web and an app and a DB, and I, I can create what I call an intention. Think of an intention as a firewall rule, but with no IP addresses. This is on a service level. Uh, I create an intention to say web can talk to a DB. Doesn't matter what IP addresses web holds, doesn't matter what DB IP addresses uh, is held. Because oh, what we have a console agent running an average service, and it's all the time it's consistently updating itself with console server to tell it I have this IP address now, I have this persona now, and console knows about it. So all what happens next is if I want to, uh, once I create that intention that web can talk to DB, and you can create that via the API, you can have that part of your workflow whenever you're creating a new workflow, for example, uh, whenever there's a new web created, create an automatic intention uh, that connects to those services, for example. Uh, what will happen is uh, we will go and deploy a certificate in, uh, in, in both of the services that allows them to talk together based on TLS. So first of all, when I, want, if I have a new service, I want to connect to more services, I will get the services that I'm allowed to see and allowed to connect to. And then, based on the intentions, if I have an intentions that allows me to connect to that service, console will connect you to that. Uh, through uh, an MTLS communication between uh, those two services at the end of the day. So the same graph, the same complexity, but without the IP addresses uh, sprawl that we have seen in a firewall wor world because all oh, what we need to do here is just define the services that can talk to each other and uh, that, will, that will help me with that. So which, <coughs> if you look at the features of Con Connect, it's the service access graph that you get as part of the intentions at the end of the day. Uh, the UI will visualize that pretty, pretty good for you. Uh, and you can have like web can talk to star or deny all, very similar to the old firewall rules, but based on the services level. <coughs> Certificate based identity. So uh, we're going to talk about the CA and how does it work as well. Uh, but eventually a console is shipped with its own CA, but you can also have Vault uh, from HashiCorp to, uh, to if you want to have more complex CA <coughs> around it. Uh, we've sh console is shipped with a side, uh, sidecar proxy. Uh, however, we can also integrate uh, with things like HA proxy and Envoy recently on Kubernetes. Um, and uh, finally, uh, you'll get MTLS and encrypted communication because of the uh, certificates at the end of the day. Uh, all right, so we covered this. This is how the intention will look like in console UI, for example. Uh, <coughs> you can modify things from here, as I said, but uh, most of the time it's all API driven. So as part of your workflow, uh, you'll, you'll try to cover that as much as possible. Uh, the certificate authority uh, is, uh, as I mentioned, we integrate with Vault as first class citizen, but uh, we're happy for you to use the console CA that is shipped with. Um, and uh, all is based on the spiffy uh, certificates at the end of the day uh, to get a certificate and sign it and provide it back. Um, if we talk about the console architecture quickly, console needs three servers at the end of the day as, as, as kind of like a minimum in order to, comp at the end of the day we have a quorum and we have to keep the votes happy. So you're talking about an odd number between three to seven max. Uh, in this example, we have three uh, and based on that, we connect to the clients, and the clients can be anything at the end of the day, anything that has a console agent on. In Docker containers, for example, we prefer to have a single client that runs on the host, and it will discover all the Docker containers and services underneath. And they'll register themselves with the servers. The servers talk to each other via what we call a LAN gossip. 
um, and uh, they sync all the information, which is the KV store, intentions, all of the information that you provide it to. Uh, and, uh, and we push the information that the clients require as well and we keep it in memory. In a multi data center uh, part of the view, uh, those data centers will operate completely separate. However, we will have some sort of a WAN gossip that happens between them, which allows you here to discover what's inside here as well. Uh, so so this, is, this is the beauty of it. And think of data center as any kind of infrastructure at the end of the day. <coughs> Read scalability is something we build for scale. We have people running over 200,000 nodes of console at the end of the day, but how do I maintain, if I'm running a server of a three server cluster, how are they gonna maintain 200,000 nodes of support, which is KV reads, which is asking a lot of noise coming in and out. And we still have to maintain the odd numbers of the servers to, con to, to stay within the quorum. So we, in enhanced read scalability, we allow you to have what we call a non-voting nodes that they mainly participate in speed, which means they're not gonna participate in quorum. Uh, all what they're doing is responding back to requests when they come back, and you can have as many as those as you want just to meet your requirement from a speed and performance as much as possible. Uh, automatic upgrades, imagine within a 200,000 node deployment, how do, we, how do we even upgrade that to a new version? Uh, so, we have a lot of people who actually try to build their own script and maintain it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and when it doesn't, that's our problem. What we give you is uh, part of, uh, the, the, it's kind of more part of the enterprise features, is an automatic way to upgrade everything, which allow you to just uh, set up the new uh, uh, baseline of version that you want to go for, and we will take the nodes offline one by one um, and automatically upgrade the whole cluster at the end of the day. Um, <coughs> so that's, that, that was an example of it. The uh, automatic backups will allow you to have automatic snapshots as well to uh, maintain all the data that you need. I think this is uh, a very interesting topic, so I made sure that I include this uh, here as well. Uh, we get a lot of questions on how does, it, how, how does console now work with something like Kubernetes? Uh, and how, how, how much are we actually uh, doing um, uh, on the Kubernetes world to make console work with it as a first class citizen? So uh, these are, most of those features are out there now. Um, some, if not, some of them will be out in the next few weeks. So the first we started with, uh, we had people come to us and ask, can I deploy console in Kubernetes? In the past, you could, it was manual, it was hard. So we, help, we, we worked on it and now you can deploy it uh, using the Helm chart uh, directly from Kubernetes itself. Uh, so now these are the two big things. My services in Kubernetes lives in Kubernetes, but how do I sync it to the rest of the world? And this is where console comes in. If I have console living in a VM farm, the VM farm can be aware of all the services that lives in Kubernetes because now we're doing a catalog service sync from Kubernetes to console and vice versa as well. So some, a service in VMware that runs on a VM farm can be now discoverable within Kubernetes mainly because we do the opposite. We sync the console service uh, into Kubernetes again. So this is, we, we think this is a big, big one and it will make uh, Kubernetes clusters and services are more aware in my infrastructure itself. Uh, the NTLS auto injections between the pods, this is the mutual TLS communication that I've described uh, briefly. Uh, that, that is actually uh, being supported. Uh, <coughs> we provide an integration uh, as a side proxy with Envoy uh, for level four and uh, auto join for, Kuberne for Kubernetes support. Uh, which, is, uh, which is mainly if I'm trying to have a console agent living outside Kubernetes and I want, uh, I want it to be aware uh, of, of Kubernetes, the platform itself. So uh, the challenge is mainly uh, that we have seen that everything for Kubernetes that was developed, it was a little bit isolated and lives within Kubernetes and doesn't allow communication with the outside world. And this is, this is what we're trying to change. We're trying to make those services more aware of each other as much as possible. Uh, which is the outside world and uh, the Kubernetes. So, um, so this is that was mainly the talk of how what console does in the service mesh environment. Um, where are we looking for, and how we how we want to see everything working at the end of the day. Uh, 
if uh, if uh, yeah, I'm, I'm probably going to open it up for questions um, unless you have any uh, further information requests. Well, thank you, Ned. Um, can we have a round of applause for? Thank you. We do have a few questions, and I, I'm very glad that we have activities. So I'll read the fact, the top voted are the, there factors that can help me decide on what to choose from, like console, I, Istio, Zookeeper, etc. Yeah, very good. So we have. If, if you go to our compare, we have a great comparison page that tells you how console is different from ETCD, how console is different from uh, Zookeeper itself. Uh, and it, it's actually, it's a very non-biased thing. It's talking about the core technology and how the technology is different than this. Where do you use this and where do you use that? Uh, so yeah, I'm not gonna spend time on it. I think we have a great write-up uh, on our website that I would, uh, I'm happy to even send it uh, and populate it between, between everyone. Uh, the second question is in the similar fashion, so I would definitely recommend. So it's about what is the difference between console and the likes of Istio and other service discovery solution with value added services like end to end encryption, among others? Yeah, well, this, this is kind of a very similar question to the first one. Uh, let me take it a step back. So uh, every one of those systems is totally different from the feature set that they give you at the end of the day. Uh, Zookeeper was one of the very the oldest ones who started this uh, journey. Um, uh, I worked with Zookeeper a lot uh, back back in my previous company. Uh, uh, so if you look at the feature set that you get, what do we need? We need a state management. Uh, most of them do state management. Uh, we need a proper key value store with, with authorization and security on top of it. Uh, probably console and ETCD tick more boxes here. Uh, then we need scalability, how much I can scale and how much I can uh, self-manage it. Uh, again, I think I would say console would do a better job than the other, but if you're a great admin and you can handle ETCD, it's totally up to you. Uh, one of the major things we talk about is this, uh, that, that we concentrate on the bigger picture, not just the single picture, and we can see ETCD more is focusing on the Kubernetes world, where we're trying to focus on everything else as well. So you'll see console is talking to everyone being deployed at every different platform um, uh, at, the, at the same time. Um, yeah, there's a vendor behind console who makes sure that they're, it's always up to date and open, opens up for PR requests and, and actual official support that gives Organize it, bigger organization, a little bit more confidence in a system like that at the end of the day. So this is this is kind of like, but I still recommend that you go to the website and read those comparisons because they're they're all valid points from a technical uh, level. Okay, uh, one more question: um, Will Terraform ever have a rollback feature? <laughs> uh, yeah, good question. So this is a, this is a Terraform question, not a console question, but I'll take it. Uh, and uh, the, the major thing in Terraform, we have what we call a planning phase. Uh, and this is, if you ask why Terraform never thought about rollback from the very beginning, because why would I need a rollback if I'm telling you what's gonna happen in the first place, and based on that, you can make a decision whether you want this or not. Uh, compared to a different mindset where I was like, ah, oh, you know what? I have something like Cloud Formation, for example, or something else that will do the job, and if it didn't work, I'll have to roll back quickly. Uh, because it doesn't tell you what is a plan phase and what's going to happen in, in front of that. Uh, I, will, uh, I will ask uh, on, on the engineering side, on the roadmap, if there's such a thing coming, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not aware, no. Well, uh, thank you, Nat. You really helped us uh, <laughs> on some of the timing. Uh, thank you for the great talk. No I problem. Hope everyone in the room appreciate it. Um, can we have one more round of applause? Yes, thank you.